displayed in our nation's capital. And for the first time, Americans visiting the White House were able to see a moving physical reminder of the Armenian Genocide. Four million knots woven by children orphaned by the great atrocities serve as a visible moving reminder of what happened a hundred years ago. And today, in communities across the world, we live with and learn from the descendants of those families who were scattered by the Armenian Genocide. In the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, we have the great honor and privilege to be a thriving center of the Armenian community. The Armenian American community today is an example of perseverance in the face of adversity. Your families, their stories, their contribution, and their histories are critical to the fabric of the Commonwealth and to the United States. The Armenian Genocide is not an opinion or an interpretation of events. It is a widely documented fact. And And it is long past time that the United States join other countries in the world. And we were so pleased uh, to hear from Austria earlier in the week and Germany yesterday in their official recognition of this genocide. It is time for the United States to join them and to recognize what has happened because that, when we use the words, when we talk about the facts of our history, that is how we heal, that is how we move on, and that is how we do not repeat the atrocities of the past. The lessons of the Armenian Genocide must never be denied, must never be forgotten. And on this solemn 100th anniversary, we must recognize these crimes against humanity and the facts and the history as they happen. And then we can move on to do what we do best, celebrate the Armenian traditions, the strength of the community and of its people. Thank you for being here and thank you for having me. Thank you, Congresswoman Clark for uh, sharing those kind words. At this time, I'd like to invite John Baboyan and Leon Janigan, who will play several musical pieces. Please enjoy.
Culturally, the language, <laughs> but English is my first language, so I want to speak to you in that language. And I put a post on Facebook this morning, and I was very, I was very happy to see all of my friends on Facebook responding and saying, "Thank you for telling us about this." Thank you for letting us know we're going to forward this to other people so they can let the world know what we have been through as a people and what we hope to accomplish from all of this. And our culture will never die. <laughs> Thank you. 
April 24th of 1915, we all know what happened and the beginnings of what happened. They took the intellectuals, the artists, the professors, the people that lead it, led us, and one of those people was the great Armenian composer Gomidas Vartabed. This is Alakias.
feel free to sing along on this if you know it. close our portion of this program and we'd like you all to join us please in singing Harmer. Oh, oh, oh. 
It was the middle of the night when the Turkish gendarmes came to gather the Armenian men from my village. I remember my father trying to keep a brave smile as he kissed me and said he'd be back soon. After that, they rounded up the children and forced us to start marching. As I was separated from my mother and sister by an SS officer, my brother Joseph tried to fight them. My brother Joseph was the first dead person I ever seen. When we reached the camps, they killed us all. I hid on the demordered bodies of my parents, then escaped in the darkness with my baby brother on my back. As we were forced to flee the fall forever, he died in my arms. I don't, don't want, want the world to just sit and watch until I become the next chapter in this story. Do you? team, we thank you for joining us to commemorate the centennial of one of the greatest tragedies of human history, the Armenian Genocide. Why do we commemorate tonight? Why not one of the many other nights when, 100 years ago, a people were being systematically eliminated from their ethnic homelands? We commemorate tonight, Friday, April 24th, because on another Friday night, 100 years ago, the Ottoman Turkish government set into motion a plan that would become the model for so many murderous regimes that followed. It wasn't the first time Armenians had been targeted at the twilight of the Ottoman Empire, and as we know all too well, it would not be the last. Furthermore, the Armenians weren't alone in their suffering, as many ethnic minority communities perished at the hands of the young Turks as they sought to purify their crumbling nation. We are honored to have representatives of many of these groups, along with fellow genocide and Holocaust survivor communities here tonight, standing in solidarity as we remember this dark chapter of our shared history. What followed April 24th, 1915 was a purge so atrocious, so thorough, that a new word had to be created to encompass the horrors that transpired. That word was genocide. Whether you've studied the ins and outs of the term from an academic perspective, grown up the descendant of survivors, or simply heard the term in the news recently, it's important to understand that genocide isn't merely a static, historic term. Quite the contrary. Think about it. The targeted execution of a people simply for being who they are is something we see coming out of the Middle East daily with ISIS murdering Christians in droves and gleefully publishing their conquests on the internet. Genocide is by no means extinct. A genocide forgotten is a genocide repeated. It is for this reason that we, the next generation of Greater Boston's Armenian community, have come together to create tonight's candlelight vigil and program. As important as it is to remember the past, it is vital to recognize all that we have accomplished in the aftermath of tragedy and look forward to a bright future. This is but one of thousands of commemorations happening around the world, some bigger, some smaller, but all Armenian. We are an engaged, energized drop of water in the rich, diverse sea of the Armenian diaspora. We've yet to realize to what degree, but this centennial is undoubtedly a turning point. We thank you for commemorating 
and celebrating this historic moment with us at the Vigil in the Park 2015. Tonight, we pay our respects to the martyrs who we lost and to celebrate the survivors who lived so that we could thrive. However, we do not descend from victims of an atrocity, but identify with saints whose sacrifice now resonates throughout our communities, our strength, and our undying resolve. My name is Kadnia Armenian, also from the AYF Nurstead chapter. As our co-chairs Armin and Palik said, thank you all for being with us today. I'm sure many of you are familiar with our most recent vigils we've had here at the park. However, many of you may recall how we first started with vigils in front of St. Stephen's Church in Watertown. A vigil not only for the 1.5 million lives we lost, but for our rightful lands outside of today's borders. A vigil honorably, honorably coined by AYF and many organizations, we have certainly come a long way from our front steps in Watertown 20 years ago. And that is because of you, our dedicated community and youth, always striving to maintain a strong diaspora in Armenia. Tonight, let's not only remember and demand justice for truth, but let's celebrate that we are resilient people, proud to be Armenian, and forever united with our beautiful nation. With a very impressive resume, our next speaker is an expert scientist in biomechanic and bioimaging and orthopedics with Harvard and Beth Israel Medical. However, we know him for his contagious efforts in Haitat, the Armenian cause, and most recently his leadership in the Massachusetts Centennial Committee. Please welcome one of our Massachusetts Centennial Committee co-chairs, Ngerara Nazarian. Thank you very much, distinguished guests, members of the community. I'd like to welcome you back to the Armenian Heritage Park, or as we like to call that, the house that Jim built. Uh, Anthony, Jim, and I are so proud to be surrounded by a wonderful uh, steering committee that helped us uh, with the pre preparations over the past few months. I would like to take a moment and acknowledge Lalik Muserian, Dr. Digran Khalikian, Jana Mabedisian, Karni Kostayan, and Herman Purutian for all their efforts. Thank you very much. Also, we couldn't be any proud of our youth who have put their heart and soul into this project over the past year. Make no mistake, our youth is here, our youth is well prepared, and our youth is ready to carry the torch. This year is a turning point. We are not victims. We are not defenseless women and children. We are a strong nation with millennia old history. The genocide was a singular event in our otherwise long history. Yet it does not overshadow our contributions to the tapestry of world uh, civilizations, nor does it define us. If you review ancient maps of the Near East, you'll see Armenia and many other nations that no longer exist yet we are here today. We know how to survive and we know how to thrive. Turks thought that they could bury us. Little did they know that we are seeds. Let those who engage in silly politics carry on with their acts. We do not need nor do we seek their acknowledgement. We know what happened to our ancestors. Righteous people of the world know what happened to our ancestors. They can keep their denials as we will build a strong and vibrant Armenia. This is our ultimate revenge. Thank you very much. Reverend clergy, distinguished guests, and fellow members of the community, good evening and welcome to tonight's program a vigil in the park. 
on April 16, 1963, in a letter from a Birmingham jail, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. wrote the following, Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly, affects all indirectly. With only a few words brilliantly strung together, King highlights an immutable and universal truth about the human condition. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Tonight, we remember the ultimate injustice. We remember that 100 years ago today, on April 24th, the Ottoman Turks began a campaign of genocide that culminated in the near eradication of the Armenian people. We remember the victims of a crime against humanity who 100 years later have seen only denial, not justice. We remember an entire century marred by genocide. Not only the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, but the Jews in Germany, the Darfuris in Sudan, the Tutsi in Rwanda, and many others. Tonight, we will honor the memory of those lost souls. We will tell their stories of bravery and resilience, and in doing so, we will tell our story. Tonight's program illuminates the darkness of the past as we showcase the vibrant global Armenia and its citizens and expound the possibilities of its future. To do so, we must first acknowledge and understand the tragic realities of what happened a century ago. Let us begin. On April 24 of 1915, the Ottoman government arrests some 250 Armenian intellectuals and cultural leaders in Constantinople, deports them to a prison in the interior where many of them are killed and more of them are imprisoned and tortured. So just as your able-bodied men were uh, wiped out by Ottoman soldiers in the winter of 1915, in the spring of 1915, the intellectual head of the culture is cut off. It happened in Hartford. It happened in Vaughan. It happened in Diyarbakir. It happened in Bitlis. It, ha it happened all over the empire. And this eradicated a whole generation of Armenian intellectual talent. In genocide, uh, if you insulate the intelligentsia, the intellectual, uh, the spiritual elite of a victim group, uh, you can more easily extinguish the rest, the unorganized, uh, leaderless rest of a nation. And that was exactly what happened. The next aspect of the Armenian genocide is the passage of emergency executive legislation. These emergency acts gave legitimation from the government to arrest and deport the Armenian people in village after village, city after city, town after town. The deportations were organized by orders from the central government in Constantinople to local governors and officials who oversaw the regional police forces. Throughout the empire, notices were put up that Armenians had to leave, or a town crier would notify the men to gather and tell the others. The local police would guard the streets and organize the march out of town. The Armenians were told they were being taken away from their homes and relocated to unspecified villages in the interior of the country. It is impossible to convey the consternation and despair this proclamation has produced upon the people. I have seen strong, proud, wealthy men weep like children while they told me they had given their boys and girls to Persian and Turkish neighbors. Many are providing themselves with poison, which they will take in case the order is not rescinded. The only way for these people to go is on foot, a journey of 60 days or more. In the heat and dust, it is still impossible for women and children and old men to start on such a journey. Even a strong man without the necessary outfit and food would be likely to perish on such a trip. In most cases, 
Armenians were deported on foot, but some others were deported via the Anatolian Railway or the Berlin to Baghdad Railway. We're familiar with the images of Jews being crammed into boxcars in Germany and Poland. Boxcars were now stuffed with 80 to 100 people who were dying uh, just of asphyxiation and starvation on their journey alone. And to make it even more grotesque, the Ottoman government made the Armenians buy their own tickets to get into these trains uh, because they were telling them that um, they would be returning. This is what the Nazis told the Jews as they arrested them and deported them as well. Armenians were deported from all over the Ottoman Empire, but deportation was not the intended result. That was officially called exile or deportation, but in reality, this was death march because purposely the people were driven under escort uh, long marches in order to exhaust them. They were driven not the nearest roads possible, but they were driven over mountains and sometimes in circles in order to make them weary. They were not allowed to rest. They were not allowed to drink when they were thirsty. And in that way, of course, the weakest in such a convoy would die first, the weakest being the old people, the youngest, the babies, the, the children, and also the pregnant women or women uh, giving birth during the deportation. Uh, genocide is a new word combining the Greek word genos, uh, genos meaning race or group, with the root of the Latin sidere meaning to kill. Dr. Raphael Lemkin, who is a professor of law at Yale University and specializing in teaching uh, matters about the United Nations, Dr. Lemkin is the man who created the word genocide. Dr. Lemkin, could you give us a little background on how you came to be interested in this genocide? I became interested in genocide because it happened so many times. It happened to the Armenians and uh, after the Armenians, Hitler took action. Lemkin became the leading force behind the drafting and adoption of the International Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, adopted unanimously by the United Nations General Assembly in Paris on December 9, 1948. I would urge, and I think that's the spirit, the unanimous view of the Assembly, that this convention be signed by all states, ratified by all parliaments at the earliest date, in order that basic human rights be given the protection of international law for the sake of progress, social and international peace. My name is Marie Karin Bogus and I am a survivor of the genocide against the Tutsi in 1994 uh, in Rwanda. Um, here tonight to share a little bit um, I'm here to share a little bit about my story and I like every time I've ever spoken at one of these events I usually have a little speech and then I get in front of people and uh, it all goes out the window so just seeing some of the things that were said earlier in the videos one of the things that struck me was the um, the part about you know forgetting history you know if you forget your history you're bound to repeat it and first of all I'm so highly impressed that there's so many people here um, the fact that this happened a hundred years ago and that you're all here speaks volumes and it gives me hope that a hundred years from now when I'm no longer alive, my grandchildren will carry this on. So thank you to the organizers for including me in this event. And thank you all of you for being here tonight. On April 7th, uh, 1994, that was exactly one day and one month before my eighth birthday. Um, the plane that was carrying the then Rwandan president um, got shot down. And from that moment on, everything changed. Now, 
when you hear the story of Rwanda, most people tend to think that it just happened, that one moment it went from being great to um, not so great. But the truth is, for as far as I can remember, I remember being afraid. Um, from as young as probably four, five, six, I knew that people weren't good. I knew that people killed, I knew that people raped, I knew that people pillaged. Um, and so it wasn't too great growing up in an environment where you were meant to feel disposable. I remember being in the classroom as early as second grade and we were meant to stand um, by ethnic groups. They would call out, um, you know, who are the Tutsis and you're supposed to stand up and uh, they would do a head count and do the same for the Hutus, but we would always be relatively fewer com in comparison to um, our other students. And we were mocked. I remember going home from school and the other kids would just, you know, these are kids your age, but they would be very cruel in, in ways that, you know, maybe they heard things that from their parents, but they would taunt you all the way, you know, home. And so from such an early age, I knew for some, some reason that my life was less, you know, meant less than, than somebody else's. And um, obviously things did escalate quickly. And during the genocide, I lost both my parents, um, three sisters, one brother, my grandmother, um, and countless other aunts and uncles. Um, but when I watched, especially the video that started before, I cannot emphasize enough how much we need to make sure that no kids get to see what I saw at that age. Um, no child deserves to see their siblings die or um, their parents or be chased out of their home just because they happen to be born to the quote-unquote wrong group. Um, I, I remember, you know, just being meant to feel like you, you do not belong. And that is a feeling that I would never hope that anybody had to experience. Um, but when I think of what happened in the genocide, I think that what happened to my family, what happened to my neighbors, friends, what happened uh, to your parents and grandparents, it should mean something. It should mean that when we come together, we remember, but I want us to do more than that. We have to be vocal about it. We, we have to make people feel uncomfortable that the fact that this is happening when so many of us, so many of the people are watching and standing by. <laughs> Until we start to feel other people's pain and start to realize that it can happen to anyone. It can, you know, it happened to the Armenian people at the beginning of the century, it happened to the Jewish people, it happened to us, it happened in Cambodia. How many more times does it have to happen for us to really take it seriously? And I, I can stand here in front of you and say, besides the fact that we both suffered genocide, we really didn't have a whole lot in common. So to stand here and think that anyone is safe from such a thing is almost naive um, and until we feel like this is a world problem it's going to keep happening and happening again and every time I think about it even though I'm standing here as an adult um, I go back to that eight-year-old and one of the things that I remember is when during the genocide um, I actually thought in my eight-year-old mind that the reason why no one was here and stopping this was because it was happening everywhere. And you can imagine my surprise when, when things ended and I realized that 
it wasn't. To, to this day, I still get shocked when I hear that somebody got married in April of 1994. Or when I hear that some other big event or life event or even insignificant event happened in April of 1994. Um, so that I'm sure that as we stand here right now, there is an eight-year-old, seven-year-old, six-year-old, 50-year-old somewhere in the same situation. And until we can empathize and think of what other people are going through, if we cannot feel what they're feeling, knowing what we've been through, I don't think the world at large will do anything. So if you can, if you can leave here with any message from me is please just be vocal and make people feel uncomfortable for standing by silently when others are suffering. Thank you. Thank you, Marie Grin, for sharing that powerful, amazing story. To another round of applause for Marie Corinne. <laughs> Oftentimes, news headlines and history books can make us forget the human reality of genocide. Only by preserving these stories and sharing them can we persuade action and effect social justice. On January 21st, 2015, Maura Healy was sworn in as the Attorney General of Massachusetts. Previously, she helped lead the Attorney General's Office as Head of Civil Rights Division and as a Chief of Public Protection in the Business and Labor Bureaus. Maura Healy has had a long career fighting for justice. As Public Protection Bureau Chief, she took on and shut down predatory lenders that were wreaking havoc on Massachusetts communities and has helped advise and defend the Massachusetts Buffer Zone Law, which protected women from being harassed at reproductive health centers. As Attorney General, Healy has pledged to enforce the Massachusetts Safe Access Law and stand against any efforts to limit women's access to the care they need. To safeguard communities, she will partner with federal, state, and local law enforcement to address gun violence, domestic violence, and sexual assault. Healy graduated from Harvard in 1992 and later from Northeastern University Law School. Early in her career, she clerked for a federal judge and served as a litigator at the international law firm Wilmer Hale and as a special assistant district attorney in Middlesex County. Please join me in welcoming Attorney General Maura Healy. Thank you so much, George, for that kind introduction. I want to thank you. I want to thank the members of the Armenian Genocide Centennial Camera uh, Commemoration Committee, uh, in particular Anthony and Jim and Arab and others for your incredible work, your energy in putting together such a moving and powerful series of events these last few days. It is such an honor for me to be here with you and among you tonight. This is a solemn but inspired space, this vigil in the park and I am so fortunate to be here. I also want to recognize a colleague in law enforcement who needs no introduction to this group, Sheriff Peter Katujan. Uh, Peter, he has represented your community so well in so many different ways and I know you'll hear from him in a bit, but I want to thank him and certainly his entire family for all they've done on behalf of Armenian Americans here in Massachusetts and indeed across the country. Thank you very much, Sheriff Patujan. It's very uh, humbling to, to follow someone like Marie Corinne, and I just want to acknowledge again the words and the spirit uh, you show and you live, and you remind us of why we are here together, me as a non-Armenian, joining in this event as we all should be. So thank you again, Marie Corinne, for your bravery. 
I was also fortunate to be among many of you earlier today at the State House. It was amazing to walk out of the State House and down the steps into the warm sunshine. Yes, it was warm at one point today. <laughs> and see hundreds and hundreds of Armenian faces and flags to really feel palpably the pride, the depth of commitment and love of your heritage. It was incredibly moving to me. And again, I am honored to be here today. I know that what's happening today, this evening, is happening elsewhere across this country, across the world. I'll first start in Rome and our Pope Francis. I think it's only fitting. Armenia being the, the oldest Christian nation in the world, to hear Pope Francis speak, to hear him speak the truth. This is a genocide. This is a genocide, and today marks, as we've heard, a hundred years since the beginning of this genocide, the beginning of this slaughter, this massacre, the most unspeakable acts and abuses one could imagine. And Pope Francis is not alone, is he? Isn't it been wonderful to hear so many people speak out across this country and across this globe to speak the truth? But unfortunately, not all are speaking the truth, are they? And that must change. As Attorney General, you know I focus thing on things like law and I focus on things like justice. Justice means something, doesn't it? And I know that justice begins by calling a crime for what it is. It's genocide. It is genocide and I call on my federal government, your federal government, to recognize this truth. And I call on President Obama and anyone looking to be president of our country to speak the truth and to recognize this as genocide. Because the truth, as Pope Francis says, the truth is the only way we begin to heal and to move forward. I also just want to speak to especially some of the young people as I look out here tonight. And uh, I find it incredibly moving to look out and, and to see all of you. I watched some of the footage today. I saw a woman in California holding the sign. It was referenced earlier, the message. The message, they tried to bury us, but they did not know we were seeds. They tried to bury us and they did not know we are seeds. You are the seeds. You know, my partner, like many of you here, is a descendant of both survivors and of people who perished. Like you, for her, everyone has a family tree that's missing a lot of branches. But you are the seeds, and yours is a story of resilience, a story of survival and of endurance, of perseverance, of courage, and of great pride. How proud your ancestors, those who survived, those who perished, how proud they must be of all of you and what you do to honor them. The Armenian community we know is a high achieving community here in Massachusetts and across this country. It is a thriving community and I commend you and you should feel so good about your contributions to music, to arts, to medicine, to commerce, and every aspect of our civic life. I know that we all share a collective pride in all that you have achieved. You carried on, you succeeded, you have done everything that they would have wanted you to do. And that is the greatest tribute you could possibly give to honor your ancestors. So today and this evening, we honor, we mourn, and we remember. We will never forget. Chi bidi mornank. Chi bidi mornank. We will never forget. Carry on. Our warmest thanks to Attorney General Maura Healy for joining us in the park tonight and her, for her continual commitment to justice. Now, 
we will hear one of famed Armenian composer Gomidas Vartabet's greatest compositions played by Stella Beglarian, courtesy of Yerazart, an organization supporting the future of Armenian music. A graduate of the Yerevan State Conservatory, Stella is an accomplished violinist and the recipient of numerous Armenian and international music awards. Tonight, she performs Gomidas's Gerung in remembrance of all victims of genocide. Please welcome Stella to the stage. At this time, 
I'd like to ask that you please light your candles. In the words of French Nobel Prize winning author Anatole France, Armenia is dying, but it will survive. The little blood that it still has left is precious blood that will give birth to a heroic generation. A nation that does not want to die, does not die. Now, the clergy of several Massachusetts Armenian churches will lead us in prayer and a moment of silence. Եվ նա իս սիրով եւ քաղցուտյան հարարածը սկով լուր մեզ հերկնից իս սրբութենեքում է արեխոսության սուրբ ասվազածնին եւ աղաչանոկ ամենայն սրբոց քոց եւ սրբոց նհադագացն մերոց ազգիս հայոց որ կադարեցան հնդածս հայոց ծեղասպանության վասն հավադո Եվ վասն հայրենյաց լուր մեզ դեր ասված մեր ներյա քավյա եւ թողս մեղս մեր արժանավորյակ հոթյան փարավորը լսկեզն փոր եւ ընսրպո հոգուտ աժմ եւ միշտ եւ աբիդյանս հավիդենից ամեն Lord have mercy Lord have mercy Lord have mercy Christ our God you crown your saints with triumph, and you do the will of all who fear you, looking after your creatures with love and kindness. Hear us from your holy, heavenly realm, by the intercession of the Holy Mother of God, by the prayers of all your saints, especially the prayers of the holy martyrs who gave their lives during the Armenian Genocide for faith and for the homeland, whom we commemorate today. Hear us, Lord and show us your mercy. Forgive, cancel, and pardon our sins. Make us worthy, thankfully, to glorify you with the Father and with the Holy Spirit, now and always, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Let us pause for a moment of silence. I should like to see any power of the world destroy this race, this small tribe of unimportant people whose history is ended, whose wars have all been fought and lost, whose structures have crumbled, whose literature is unread, whose music is unheard, whose prayers are no longer uttered. Go ahead, destroy Armenia, see if you can do it. Send them into the desert without bread or water, burn their homes and churches, then see if they will not laugh, sing, and pray again. For when two of them meet anywhere in the world, see if they will not create a new Armenia.
For many in the audience, audience tonight, that selection from William Saroyan's The Armenian and the Armenian is more than familiar. It has become the unofficial slogan of the Armenian diaspora, and for good reason. The tides are changing. We are, wait, we are riding this wave of change. Evidence of that is a Turkish organization, the Boston Bulular, who's here tonight in, in a large group in support of the Armenian cause. A hundred years have passed since the terrible tragedy that befell our ancestors, and yet we have not succumbed to victimhood. Instead, survivors have rebuilt their communities around the world, and their descendants continue to make a positive impact on their local communities as well as in Armenia. Our next speaker is one such descendant. On January 21st, 2011, Peter J. Kutujan was sworn in as Sheriff of Middlesex County. Prior to being appointed Sheriff, then Representative Kutujan represented the 10th Middlesex District in the, in the Massachusetts State Legislature. There, he was the lead sponsor of the annual Armenian Genocide Commemoration and spent several years spearheading efforts to win approval for the Armenian Heritage Park. In recognition of his leadership on behalf of the Armenian American community, Sheriff Kutujan has received the prestigious Mukhidar Gosh Medal from Armenian Prime Minister Dikran Sarkisyan, as well as the Ellis Island Medal of Honor. This man needs no introduction, but I'll introduce him anyway. Please welcome Sheriff Peter Kutujan. Thank you, George. And as George mentioned, I am the Sheriff of Middlesex County. I am the High Sheriff of Middlesex County. And when our forefathers wrote up the Constitution, they didn't understand that someday they would actually have a high, high sheriff of Middlesex County. <laughs> it is wonderful to be with you tonight. And uh, Attorney General Healy, thank you for your kind words, and Marie Corinne and our beautiful musicians. That was a time of mourning. That was a time of darkness. Now is the time we emerge into the light. And I must be honest with you that over these last couple of days, being in Washington, being in Cranston, being in Worcester, being here today with you, last night, tomorrow in Lowell, New York on Sunday, that I should feel more mournful. I'm sure you feel very much the same, and I feel so conflicted, because when I look at this amazing crowd of people, and the crowd that we had earlier, I feel lightened, I feel alive. Do you feel the same way? Yes. And do you know why that is? That is because we have survived. Is that not right? Yes. Let's take a moment just to look around ourselves right here, right now. For those in the front, take a look back at that beautiful sight back there. We must think about what we're doing right now. Where we are on Armenian Heritage Park, right here in Boston. Let's take a moment to reflect how long we've wondered where we as a people would be on April 24th, 2015 years, 200, 2015, 100 years after the official beginning of the genocide. We have mourned, let us look into the future. My grandparents, we might think of as past, but they were what created their children's future, and my future, and my children's future, and all of your ancestors, your great-grandparents, your grandparents, your parents, whomever they might be, fought to create our future. Because my family's story is not much different than yours. My grandparents were Abraham and Zadoe Katujian. They lived in Marash. They married when my grandfather, Abraham, was 26 years old. My grandmother was 19 years old. They began their life together. And then one day, soldiers came into their town and took people away. They were not together. They were separate. My grandmother ended up fleeing with nothing but the clothes on her back to end up in Syria, in Aleppo, working in an orphanage. My grandfather ended up fleeing as well, carrying my Aunt Veronica, following the French cavalry through snow, 
seeing death and devastation just like all of our ancestors saw. Neighbors and friends and relatives, loved ones that they saw. And through this trek, through this journey, he carried my Aunt Veronica, who was very young at the time. And through this entire trek, she wanted to sleep. By the way, when we feel cold tonight, we think about what our people went through, right? We shouldn't be complaining too much, should we now? I must admit I complained a little bit earlier, by the way. <laughs> he carried her through the snow and the death and devastation and kept her alive because at times she simply wanted to go to sleep and he would not let her go to sleep. He sang to her, he shook her, he walked her, he made sure she did not go to sleep because he knew that if he let her go to sleep, she would die. She came to this country and he came to this country and through learning of my grandmother's existence through the American Red Cross International Family Finder program, he sent for her and she came here and they began their lives here in the United States. And they had four children. We don't know if they ever had children back in Armenia because what happens with so many of our people that went through this, they witnessed the unspeakable, they did just that when they got here, they did not speak of it because they did not want to burden any of their children with what they had seen. It was too dark, it was too difficult to share. They had three sons and a daughter, and all three of their sons served in the military. And my grandparents became the greatest patriots this nation could ever hope for. My grandmother could speak almost no English, and when my uncle Arson died, she became a gold star mother. For those of you who don't, that means that your child was killed during service in the military. She became a gold star mother. She couldn't even speak English, but she loved this country. My grandfather used to say to my father all the time, my son, this is the greatest country in the world because you can be anything you want to be. Because my grandparents didn't just appreciate this great country for the refuge it gave them, but for the opportunity it gave all of them, for their children, and all of us here today. And aside from their resilience in the face of unimaginable horror, what is most striking about the stories of my grandparents and all of our people that had come over here that survived was that they would not let these events define their lives. They came here to a new land to raise families and to educate their children and to deny victory to their oppressors. Now for 100 years we have been having a collective conversation about the Armenian Genocide. But there has to be more to being Armenian than being descendants of genocide survivors because then we become victims. We need to have a collective conversation about what to do over the next 100 years to see what it would look like as we will not be defined by the genocide because we have so much more to offer this world. Have you not seen it tonight? Yes. I often hear the debate about where to focus our energy, our activity and financial support. Should it be strengthening our local Armenian schools, cultural organizations, churches, political organizations here in diaspora communities? Should we work to strengthen the Republic of Armenia politically, economically, socially, putting the viability of our homeland first? Should we seek genocide recognition? Should we fight for the independence and the recognition of Nogorno-Karabakh? Or is it a blend of all five of those? Zartok refers to a period in the 19th century of Armenian history, a period also called the reawakening, the metamorphosis, a time when literary and political leadership and educational leadership flowered in Armenia. And I am challenging us right here, right now, and especially our youth that has put together this amazing program today for a 21st century Zartok by our community right here, right now in America. And this awakening could build coalitions and entrenching Armenian Americans into their cities and towns to help build state and local governments. Also giving us the tools to support a strong Armenia and a strong Artsakh. And we must build a new generation of political leaders for our future so that justice or any other issue that may, we may want to address as a people is in our own hands and not at the mercy of others. You see, all too often in our desire, very appropriately, to hold on to our culture, we send our children to Sayanova dance lessons on Monday night. Bad example, perhaps. 
It's important. I, 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 you'll understand why I said that, not because Sayed Nova is bad, by the way. <laughs> we send them to Sayed Nova on Monday nights, on Cafe Anush on, I think it's Thursday nights, and we have Bible, Bible lessons on, on Friday nights, and we have, uh, we have a, 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 our, a, our ACEC meetings and our ACYO meetings, and we have our dances on Saturday nights. And so every night of the week we're doing something with our own community, and we are not building outside of our own community. Now, when we think about Bill Belichick wearing the Armenian flag pin, right? Right in the face of President Barack Obama on the White House lawn. That was because he knew one of our people, one of our tribe was out there, and he knew our story and decided to wear that in support of us because we had reached out to him. We can accomplish so much more, not passively, but by being active, not looking inward, but by also looking outward, joining civic and local political committees, supporting young Armenians in their educational and uh, employment endeavors by mentoring and using our connections to find them placements in these great institutions, to support our non-Armenian friends in office and places of influence in order to build relationships that will help us take office in the future, to run for office on the local level, whether it be as a counselor or an alderman or selectman or even town meeting member, planning board or library board, as we build up our clout to run for higher office, to take those higher offices, supporting our people who decide to run for office. And while I am a member of a party, I do not care about partisanship when it comes to Armenian issues. With our community, we should not care as much about whether there is an R or a D next to a name as whether there is an IAN at the end of it. And we need to elect Armenian Americans to positions and we need to place Armenian Americans in positions of power and influence because politics and policy is not just a spectator sport. One may think of it as a community we stand around, we sit around an arena and we cheer on a team and we boo the other team and we might have a small amount of influence in the outcome of that game but until we actually get on that field and participate in the game we can never truly control what is happening on that field, correct? We should be in the arena, we should be acting, we should be declaring, we should take charge of our own destiny, not leave it in the hands of others. And this is also an opportunity to build coalition with others who have suffered human rights atrocities. Marie Corrin spoke today, and her story could be just like our story. It is no different. And the Jews and the Cambodians, they're all the same story. Every day, even today, we hear news of people who are being persecuted and gruesomely treated, slaughtered for keeping their Christian faith. Even today, we have people and villages and churches in Syria that are being slaughtered and destroyed. Even today, it is happening now. And what are we doing about that? What is our government doing about that? Let us not become desensitized to the horrific acts that are going on today because it's all too easy with a 24 hours news cycle. To keep silent is not to respect our own martyrs, our own, our own saints, because we can lift our voices to bring awareness to the atrocities. And together we can not just improve lives, but we can actually save lives. Because the genocide, genocide is not just a crime against Armenians or Rwandans or Cambodians or Jews, but a crime against all of humanity. And we have proclaimed never again, so let's make our pledge so. Let's stand up for those who are not able to stand, to shout for those that have no voice. Today, 100 years later, we remember our martyrs and our saints. We remember the unspeakable horrors that our survivors faced, dispersed to all corners of the world. They created new communities, built churches and schools, and they created new Armenias every day. Let's no more be defined by the genocide because we are not victims. I challenge us to strive for a 21st century Zartung right here in America. It is fitting that tonight's vigil is organized by the youth of community, our community. And by God, look what they have done tonight. Is this not impressive? 
It's all too easy to say, what are the youth doing? Are they talented? Are they good? You can see they can do anything tonight. It is fitting that tonight is, involved, is, is organized by our youth because our youth is more connected and more engaged and will have a stronger voice than ever before. Because to all of us, this is our movement. This is our moment. This is our own destiny to shape together. This is our 21st century Zartonk. This is our new Armenia. Thank you and God bless. Thank you, Stella, for sharing with us another Gomidas masterpiece, Shushiki, dedicated to Armenia's future generations. Also, our gratitude to Scout Tu Fengchen for providing stunning photography from her latest compilation, There Is Only the Earth, Images from the Armenian Diaspora Project, released this month. Anais Kechejian, a proud member of the local Armenian community, 
has developed a unique way to connect with her ancestry. Anais, who is currently a mechanical engineering student at Northeastern University, founded Stand Up For Your Survivor, a way for all of us with links to genocide survivors to make their stories known. Please welcome Anais Kechejia. survivors. All eight of my great-grandparents survived the Armenian Genocide and it's very much a part of my identity as an Armenian American. I've always been very appreciative of the fact that my great-grandparents endured all sorts of unimaginable atrocities to escape genocide and come to America. I'm sure that sentiment resonates with a lot of people here tonight. Growing up, it wasn't hard to do the math. I remember thinking 15 will mark the 100th anniversary of the genocide. And in that same train of thought, I also realized that unfortunately, most genocide survivors won't be there to the, at the 100 year mark. In anticipation of this unique moment in our history, I realized that if we as a community wanted to continue the fight for genocide recognition, we needed to consider doing something that withstands the test of time. So in an effort to capture the inextricable link that exists between genocide survivors and the diaspora, I created a project called Stand Up For Your Survivor. It started a few years ago when I asked members of the Boston community to send in photographs of their relatives who survived the Armenian Genocide. In return, participants received posters featuring enlarged images with the faces of their survivors. The posters created a powerful visual on the floor of the Massachusetts State House during the annual Genocide Commemoration Ceremony. As you can see on the screen behind me, it's a simple project. It's simple to conceptualize and simple to execute. But Stand Up For Your Survivor effectively shows the world that even though the Armenian Genocide happened 100 years ago on the other side of the globe, it matters to us here and now. We all care about genocide recognition because we care about justice. For those of you in the audience who have posters, I ask you to please hold them up. Stand Up For Your Survivors. Standing Up For Your Survivor isn't something that we do once a year on April 24th. It's something we do every day day by virtue of being successful, happy, truth-seeking people who are proud to be involved in the Armenian community. I stood up for my genocide survivors this past summer by participating in the Leo Sarkisian internship through the Armenian National Committee. The summer before that, I stood up for my survivors by working at Camp Hayastan. Growing up, I stood up for my survivors by attending Armenian elementary school, Saturday school, and Sunday school, all geared towards preserving our language and culture. Looking to the future, one of the greatest challenges we face as a community is making sure that Armenian schools, churches, and other institutions are in place so that the next generation can stand up for their survivors. It's imperative that our kids understand the significance of our link to the past. The next generation will never have the opportunity to meet their survivors, which is why I'm calling on each of you to document your ancestors' experiences. Dig out the old memoirs from the trunk of your grandparents' attic or the box of photos in the back of the closet before they're lost forever. Save them, and don't just save them, but also share them. It's our job to stand up for our survivors by making sure that our survivors' stories are never forgotten. Another great way to stand up for your survivor is to visit Armenia. Everyone should go at least once, whether you are a Kachajan, a Katujan, a Kardashian, or someone who is exploring their Armenian background. Connect with the food, music, and traditions that make up what it means to be an Armenian. This centennial year has proven to be a great opportunity for Armenians from around the world to come together in commemoration of our shared history and survival. But there is so much more to being Armenian than the genocide. Stand up for your survivor by uniting with Armenians and friends of Armenians and celebrating our beautiful culture. Thank you, and thank you to my family. Thank you, Anais, for creating this special project and for sharing it with us tonight. Anais is a prime example of the engagement and diversity of Greater Boston's Armenian youth. 
Armenians from all walks of life forge connections to their cultural identity every day. Last month, we brought together a cross-section of our community to discuss their identity and hopes for the future. Let's take a look at what happened. I went to my grandmother's village. As we were there, we were taking pictures of a beautiful stork's nest outside of a man's home. And he invited us to take a better picture on top of the roof of his shed. So as we were standing there and taking pictures, he asked why we were there. And we said my, our grandparents had been born in that village and that we were Armenian. And the man said to us, I'm half Armenian. Both of his grandmothers were Armenian. My grandmother had escaped and his grandmothers hadn't. At one point, uh, he said to his wife, he says, we cannot uh, begin to understand their attachment to this place until we understand the magnitude of the crime that was committed against them. Armenian is so inextricable to how I think who I am and everything I've ever done. It's hard to know where being Armenian begins and where I begin. Armenian to me um, really means kind of looking back at your history um, and drawing strength from what your ancestors did. I know very well my history and I know that I have also some responsibilities as an Armenian woman. Well, to be Armenian is to be me. So it's kind of hard to separate. I've, I've kind of grown up with the, the notion that, 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 you know, even being born in Lebanon, that I'm, I'm Armenian. Whether you are, you know, so to speak, 100% Armenian, 50% Armenian. I actually heard someone earlier this year um, at a talk say something very interesting. Being Armenian isn't a, a measure. It's not like a gas tank. You can't be half full of Armenian. You know, you, you are Armenian, and to me, being Armenian is a choice, and it's not one that's made for you, it's made by you. So I went to Armenian Sisters Academy, I did Saturday school, um, I was very much involved in the leadership side of ACYWA, I went to Armenian church every Sunday. A part of a global community. Survivor, being persistent, being strong, um, and I think I have that in my personality partly because of being Armenian. I was lost in Paris, and I came out of the metro and I looked up and I saw a bakery in French and underneath were Armenian letters. And I walked in and I told them my name. Um, and not only did I leave with a backpack full of food and hugs and warmth and phone numbers and maps, um, but an invitation for Easter. And to me, that example was a, is what it is to be Armenian. You, you, you meet another one in any circumstance. They are family, they are Hanami, um, and we are all part of, of each other's world and community. I find that, you know, we talk about the Armenian Genocide, we talk about diplomatic relations, and there's that elephant in the room, which is the Armenian Genocide. And people talk about reconciliation. Even Turks say we need to, we need to get to know one another. And I believe Turks want to speak to Armenians, and Armenians want to speak to Turks. But it's not just about reconciliation, it's about truth and reconciliation. So in order for Turks and Armenians to really start that dialogue, you need to deal with the truth issue, and the Armenian Genocide is a truth. It's really about social justice in the world. It's really, the Armenian issue is part of a much bigger problem of genocide in the world. It's a much bigger problem of oppression and, you know, violence against women and, and all sorts of other issues. And it, it needs to be part of that discussion. But I think that, that, that if, if it were just a sort of self-interested nationalist thing, it wouldn't work for me. But it's this bigger picture that I think is really, has sort of taken over my thinking about the Armenian Genocide. You know, the question is, you can be given a second chance, but what are you going to do about it? Well, it got to a point where I was like, how can I, as an artist, kind of do my part? How do we keep what our parents and our grandparents have given you and I alive for the future? And how do we kind of keep that fire alive? Vartan Gregorian once said to me, he said, we have to be good ancestors, which means that all Armenians have to be good ancestors. And if you have to be a good ancestor, you have to set an example for your children and your grandchildren. For my children, because it's so important to me, 
or had such a central focus for me, the injustice, I think also has played with my children. You can think about making change in Armenia all at once, which is not plausible, or you can think of a bunch of individual projects that as they kind of start interacting, they start making changes. It's often really what drives you. Like, do you care about sort of the orphanage? Do you care about um, the church uh, in Armenia? Do you care about um, you know, economic development or small business? Whatever that little stripe of what you want to do, the tree project, that's what you should be involved in Armenia because we need it all. It's an artist's duty to express, you know, the pains and the history, the tr trials and tribulations and triumph of your people. So I really just started with me writing a song about the genocide called Open Wounds and it was just very well received. And then we went on a step further and made these t-shirts that said our wounds are still open and we started spreading them to like any celebrity and industry contacts we had. Through hip hop, through fashion, through social media, we can really use this to raise awareness. But Armenians, by and large, from what I know, you know, they, they like to challenge um, the you know, the accepted norms. They like to think differently, um, and they're very creative, and they, they come up with new ideas. And so the entrepreneurship model really fits the Armenian. Um, and I think that that's something that we're just beginning to see kind of, you know, rise. And because we realize that we're such a force to be reckoned with, so I think that's kind of the main message of the 100th anniversary that I think everybody should feel. That we truly are just kind of truly getting started and truly owning our you know existence here there's no way that the armenian people can be made whole again but that doesn't mean that we don't try to at least uh, alleviate the situation uh, that was created by that genocide I see a lot of brightness and happiness i think armenia is still going through a time of kind of rebuilding but there's really no one contribution you can make to the betterment of armenia um, but my first piece of advice is if you haven't gone you must go and so ryan said he find two See if they won't create a new Armenia. We bring up our children to be very proud of that heritage. And not just because we're part of an ancient culture and a culture that's contributed so much to the world. It's a, it's a culture that has deep values, values that were rooted you know, hundreds and thousands of years ago in Christianity that have since kind of evolved into bettering their lot in the world for others. There you have it. There are as many ways to get involved as there are interesting, engaging, passionate people here tonight. I encourage you to take a look around and find someone new to connect with. Moments like these are all too rare in life. Looking around this park, it's hard not to smile. While the tragic event that we have gathered to commemorate will forever remain a scar on the face of the human race, what has risen out of its ashes is an undeniably beautiful, tenacious diaspora, of which I am honored to be a part. For the past 100 years, we have not simply survived or merely eat pie. We have not gone quietly into the night. We have defied seemingly insurmountable odds to create a truly remarkable community. We have our ancestors and those who helped them to thank for this miracle. For the past 100 years, our great-grandparents, grandparents, and parents have marched forward for us. It is now our turn to carry on for our descendants. 100 years from now, what will these descendants of ours commemorate? If it is the very same story of rebuilding, we will have come up short. We stand on the shoulders of giants. So formidable is the platform that they have built for us that it is insufficient simply to have reached this major historical milestone. The centennial is a turning point. Now is the time for our revival. Now is the time for our rebirth. Now is the time for us to band together to take the next step in the evolution of our people. We, the next generation, must lead the way. It starts here. It starts tonight. Thank you.